Okay, so can you all see a geological map of uh, Isla? Let me just get this pointer working. Here we are. I'm going to move the pointer slowly. So we're here up in the northeast corner of Isla in Bonnerhaven. Um, the key features of the east side of Isla are the Jura Quartz site, which is in yellow, and underneath that, the, the uh, Bonnerhaven dolomite in a sort of purplish color here, which overlies the Port Askig tillite. And the key thing we're going to be talking today about is the Bonnerhaven dolomite, and we're going to see bits of the Jura Quartz site. So we're going to be talking about this bit of the stratigraphy at the upper part of the D Dalradian sequence on Isla. Uh, someone's chatting to me. Um, Screen share, please. It is screen scaring. Colin Monroe. Can everybody see my screen? Did someone put a thumbs up so they can see my screen? Yes. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, okay, so um, someone else is chatting. Yes, okay, fine. Okay, so this is the uh, this is the part of Isla we're going to visit, and we're sitting in Bonnerhaven at the moment. Um, let's move on. This is the BGS map of the area, just to show you a bit more detail. Um, BGS map shows the, the northern part of Isla here with the Jura Quartz site in yellow and the Bonnerhaven Dolomite section that we're going to be visiting in sort of various shades of blue and purple. And if you look over on the right hand side of this screen, I've just uh, quickly scanned the, uh, the, the, the vertical section on the BGS map. And you can see here the, the Port Askeg Tillite formation down here, the Jura Quartzite in yellow here. Uh, confusingly, the Quartzites in the Port Askeg formation are colored in yellow. The Jura Quartzites in the same shade of yellow and the and a quartzite unit that's actually in the middle of the Bonnerhaven dolomite formation, also yellow, um, which is a bit confusing, but they, are, they have got these uh, QQ, QQ symbols on them, so it does help a little bit. What we're gonna see when we go over here is uh, the, some of the members of this dolomite section, uh, members two, three, and four. Num uh, section, member one, which sits on the Port Askeg tillite, occurs down at Bunnerhaven and Kalila to the south. Um, we're not going to see those today. So we're going to be seeing a very short and small bit of member two, lots and lots of member three and member four and the Jura Quartzite. So let's go on. This is the, this is the map that I uh, put in the guidebook that I wrote with Alistair and uh, Roger. And we start at Bunnerhaven. Um, I've just simplified the map to show the not show all the members of the Bonnerhaven dolomite and I've colored it all in blue which is fine um, but you can see here we've got this sort of uh, these sort of on echelon anticline features which are going to, we're going to be talking about today um, and the whole sort of feature is anticlinal is anticlinorium of the top end of the Isla anticline as it sort of plunges sort of uh, generally these folds plunge northeast except this fold here, which seems to plunge the other way. So um, it's a strange sort of uh, structure. And we've got this thing called the Balsa Fault, which we're gonna have a look at as well, but there's some very steep dips, some strange structures um, here. So the Isla Anticline is actually quite a complex feature. It has uh, several facets of it, this sort of on echelon arrangement of anticlinal axes. Um, obviously these folds are formed uh, in the Grampian orogeny or the Grampian phase of the Caledonian orogeny and in the, in the sort of, uh, in the old division. So, this is 470 million year old folding and faulting. Um, and we'll have a talk about the balsa fault and the fold structures as we get to the end. And as I said earlier, we're going to, as I said in the, in the introduction notes, we're going to follow this route and we're going to look at some localities along the coast here. And at the end, we'll have a sort of wrap up and a sort of review of where we're at. So we're going to look at the rocks first. We're going to do geology properly. We're going to look at rocks and understand the rocks as we see them before we start We'll do, we'll do some jumping to conclusions at the very end, okay? The, the red breadcrumb line is the sort of route we're going to go north from Bonnerhaven, uh, tramp across the moor. Uh, two hours later, we're going to reach here. Uh, I'll, I'll, this, is a, this is a time warp tonight, so we'll get you there very quickly. And then we're going to walk along the coast uh, there, and then we're going to tromp back over here near Ruval Lighthouse and then back along the coast 
back to Bonahaven. Next slide. This is a detail map that I've been compiling over all the visits I've made there over the years. Um, and it's sort of, uh, uh, the idea here is I can sort of, uh, and I'm going to sort of refer to this map and, and flip back into this map as I go along. But here's the sort of more, more detail of the, of, the, of the localities, one through, one, two, three, through to seven. And I'll refer to this map and flick to this map as we go along so you won't get lost, hopefully. Right, before I start the walk, I just wanted to show you a, a GPS. Okay, so I don't know if you can see uh, an aerial photograph from expert GPS of the north corner of Isla. I'm sort of waving at it here. Here's Bunnahaven. I'm just going to zoom in. All right, and here's the distillery. And here's our cars. We're all parked here, so we're all standing and having a chat. And I've done all the bullshit, and we're now about to start the walk. We're going to walk up here. We're going to cross can't over. Can't see any, can't see can't any see pictures. Anything. Can't see any pictures. Um, sharing my screen. Dave, make sure you're sharing the right part of your screen. I think you're sharing your PowerPoint with us. Okay. Uh, okay, I'm I'm seeing it on my screen. So, I'm, uh, all right. Okay. Okay. You're right. Then let me let me let me try something. Out. Let me just try. It. Let me try. It. Uh, That's it. Is that it? Yeah. Okay. I need to, I need to, to, yeah, I just can't flip it. I just can't flip it. Right. That's fine. Thank you everybody. Right. I'm uh, now on a, looking at aerial photograph, trying to zoom in out. There's Bunnahaven and we're, we are parked here and we're going to walk along here down this little track. We're going to cross over the Margadale river and we're going to follow this trail along the coast and zoom out a bit. I know it's a bit moving. And then we're going to follow over the moor, over the moor here, past the mountain, the Skurvrek, past these Wielokans, and we're going to end up at the little uh, ruined farm settlement of Balsa, and we're going to climb Malabalsa. Now, on the, normally we don't go climbing Malabalsa because it takes too long to climb it, but today we've got time. So we're going to climb the mountain and look at the view from there, and we're going to follow this beautiful coastline, sort of northeastwards, all the way along here. We're going to stop for our lunch here. And we're going to end up at this big bay here. And then we're going to walk across here, this little bialak here, and then follow the coast. There's the lighthouse at the top. And we're going to follow the coast all the way back to Bunnahaven. So ready for a nine hour walk? That's fine. Um, right, I'm going to have to make sure I do this properly now to get back to the slideshow, which is this one. So let's start walking. First of all, if you ever do go there, make sure you do check with Isla Estates. There is a, there is a, a lot of deer on the north end of Isla. So it's stalking season, you do need to check, but most of the time it's fine. Um, but the usual uh, access applies at the gate here. And as we start walking up the hill here, uh, we're looking back on to the, the, the distillery and we're following this very vague sort of a uh, four wheel drive sort of track, which comes and goes. But we do seem to follow it most of the way across the moor. It does make life a little bit easier. Um, we follow it up here to Skirbrek here, and we're going to sort of go through this, go through this Bialik pass here um, and, and towards Balsa. And here we are at Balsa. And it's a lovely place. Uh, this is a first coffee break. Fika to the Swedish students where we sit down and have cake and coffee. And we look at Collinsy in the background. So that's a, a, a trip for another day, but that's Collinsy in the background there. This is the hill of Malabolsa uh, to, the, to the west of uh, Balsa village, Balsa township. And we climb up this, and this is the view you get. And what we see here is uh, a, a wave cut platform, a raised wave cut platform here, quite prominent with uh, steeply dipping or westerly dipping Jura quartzite. Over most of Isla, 
on the Isla Anticline, we're on this, the other limb of the Anticline and everything dips southeast. But this is the bit of Isla where the, on the other side of the Anticline, we actually see northwest dips on the other side of the Anticline. So we're seeing some northwest dipping quartzites in some lovely uh, sort of coastal sort of scenery here. And we've got a wave cut platform here and a wave cut platform there. So two wave cut platforms. And we'll come on to the story of the wave cut platforms and this cliff line and develop that, that sort of glacial geomorphological story as well as looking at the, the Dalradian stratigraphy and structures. So, another one. This is looking sort of along the coast to where we're going to be walking. So this is from Malabalsa looking towards Jura. Jura's in the background here in the haze. And this is our coastline. This is Port Struthan. This is Port Achotain and Beanduras at the back here. So we're going to be going along this down here, following down here, and get down to the coast. We're going to do a quick left turn and look at the Jura Quartzite and return. So we're going to do a sort of double back here. So we're going to have a quick look at the Jura Quartz, the westerly dipping Jura Quartzites. We're going to have a spend a little time in here. This is locality two at Port and Struthen. Um, then we're going to walk around here, seem to see some lovely stuff around here, uh, have our lunch down here, and then end up down there this afternoon. Hope you're enjoying the reality suspension. So here we are walking down the little path, a lot of deer trods here, so you can follow yourself. It's not, it's not too jungliferous, and uh, we can get there down this tracks, so through the bracken, and down to the coast. And we you start to see some geology here, we've got some quartzites in the cliffs here, uh, some dolerite dikes sticking up here. And we're starting to see some, after two hours, we've got, after two hours of walking, we've now found our first rock. So locality one, one through thing, this is the west side of, of, the, uh, of the bay, where we start to see some Jura quartzite dipping west. Strange Jura quartzite, the bedding planes seem very accentuated. And I wonder whether as part of this anticline system that the, these competent quartzite beds have actually had some bedding slip. You know, as the, as the fold has happened, the beds have slipped. It doesn't look like this in other parts of, Dura, of Isla. It's a strange sort of a, a place uh, to see the Jura quartzite like this. And, and some strange sort of internal folds in this sort of a competent, as these competent beds get deformed, there's some strange folding going on. Um, can't quite explain it myself, but there's some weird bedding in here. Uh, and some lovely caves. Here's uh, Professor Skelton enjoying his tea break. And um, this is, this is uh, some caves, some beautiful cave, rim, cave scenery on the, to the, on the west end of the excursion. So let's move on. We, as we walk back towards Port and Struthen, uh, it, there's this big quartzite ridge. Um, and you could pass a little, little pool here. It's beautiful scenery. We come to this little notch here and we, we are then become, we come to what I've called locality two, which is the whole central part of Potten's Thruthane, which is the sort of the core of this, uh, this part of the Isla Anticline. First thing we see when we come through that notch is quartzite here and a sort of cleave meta mudstone here. And this is actually the base of the Jura quartzite. So we're seeing here the top of the Bonnehaven Dolomite formation. Remember, it's, a Dolom it's called the Bonnehaven Dolomite formation, but sometimes people better call it the Bonnehaven formation because it's not all Dolomite. This is cleave meta mudstones and silt meta silt stones, meta sandstones in the in top of this member four, and we go into the Jura quartzite up here. Further into the bay, we see a lot more of these member four uh, lithologies. We get some meta silt stones, meta mudstones, some meta sandstones, and a sort of quite a prominent thing that occurs in the middle of member four, which is a sort of white dolomite, and there's some chunks of it kicking around here. But there's a sort of central ridge here that's got this this some more white dolomite chunks lying around so we've got but the dips here are quite steep virtu vertical go around the corner here some vertical beds going dipping slightly to the west and here's some beds dipping to the east some maybe there's a fold or a fault in here there's a lot of a lot of um uh, sort of structural deformation in this area yeah other parts of it are quite as uh, relatively low dips here's the here's the here's the sort of white dolomite ridge in the center of the uh, the bay and here's some uh, member four sandstones, and I think this may be the, the sort of dolomitic stuff at the top of member three. So um, this in the core of the sort of anticline feature here, because we're getting into a member three being slightly older. 
So this is sort of, um, this is member four in Pontstruthane. And here's some of the member four sandstones in that area, sort of a nice sort of some ripple, ripples and cross beds and things in here, sort of flazer bedding and stuff. So a nice little bit of sedimentology in here to be looked at. And one of the key things we see here is this thing which I often refer to as the knobbly stack, which is one of the a sort of stack of a, I think it's still a mem the member four white dolomite, um, but it's quite a prominent feature. And you sort of see this as you go around Puttenstruth and you see this sort of stack everywhere. There it is here. Um, and here's the white dolomite and a lot of sort of calcite veining and a lot of structural I think there's a dike down the middle of it as well a uh, tertiary dike down the middle of it and it's quite complicated and here's dr skelton professor skelton standing on a rock telling everybody all about his uh, the fold that he's standing on so there's some small scale folding in here and a lot of quartz veining so this is very typical of the sort of deformation you get in the core of the isla anticline and uh, alistair's an expert on fluid flow and uh, and what, what, what and the sort of structural and, and sort of fluid ex, and metamorphic significance of this area. I don't know if you want to say anything, Alistair, at this stage. No, you carry on. Okay, <laughs> thanks, Alistair. Um, I took a picture of this. When I first saw this, I thought it was ripples, but Alistair assures me that it's mullion structures and it's sort of crenulation cleavage. Is that right, Alistair? That must be a different Alistair. <laughs> Someone told me it was a there were mullion structures, um, maybe, and I'm sure it was you. Anyway, never mind. Not, not me. I don't know what a mullion structure is. <laughs> anyway, I think it's a it's a two cleavages uh, intersecting at, at a sort of angle that gives you this sort of this sort of this sort of mullion structure feature and in, in sort of vertical bedding as well. So again, this is all part of this island, the core of the anticline and the and the balsa fault zone um, that we that that, that, I, that I talked about earlier. Um, so quite a lot of deformation and sort of uh, messing around going on here. And in the back of the cliff, we see some quartzites here. This is the sort of cliff turning away from the sea here. And here's some, uh, here's some Swedish students up here looking at this. And this is some bedded quartzites, which are member two. And the point that, that so we've got member two and a thin member three, which is the sort of, we're going to see lots of member three later on, but here it's quite thin and then member four, and because we're just slightly to the west of the Balsa Fault itself, um, Ian certainly believes that the, the Balsa Fault is controlling the thickness of the sedimentation here of the, of the units. And the member three is very thin to the west of the fault. So it could be indicating that the Balsa Fault, although it's got a lot of deformation that's obviously uh, in the Grampian phase, it may have had an earlier history in the, in the deposition time of, let's say, for sake of talk in 650, Billion years ago, it may have been active as, a, as an extensional uh, listric fault controlling the thickness of sedimentation, and then it was then reactivated and uh, became a sort of a, a, a compressional reverse feature in the uh, in the Grampian orogeny. So this is some mem thin member two quartzites at the back of the bay there. Okay, so we're going to leave the bay. Here's our knobbly stack for, for reference. So we're going to sort of walk uh, east as we're going to do, and we're going to cross over, cross the bay to the far end of the bay here, to these yellowish sort of rocks at the far end. Um, so, so this is anyone that's following on a map. This is locality three. Um, so there's looking back at locality two here, and we've on these sort of yellow rocks on the far side of the bay here, and these are the, the start of the main thicknesses and the main outcrops of the member three unit which is the one that contains all the stromatolites and if you look at it from this view you see sort of hummocky bits in the foreground it sort of looks a bit strange and a bit bumpy um, and then there's some layery things here so you sort of have a look you get on this and you don't get when you get your eye in you suddenly realize what you're standing on you're standing on a whole load of exhumed bioherms or heads of stromatolites there are, uh, you can see them all sitting here they've been sort of eroded out yeah and that's um, it's, it's really quite spectacular once you stand on it and you st when you stand here then you start looking around you just suddenly find you're s completely surrounded by them you're standing here on these here, and then you look across oh, there's some more over here more over here this whole there's, there's just you're just surrounded by these sort of strom stromatolite mounds so you can see they're a, a meter or so thick maybe two three meters thick uh, three or four meters across 
here's some people for scale. I think that's Ian Fairchild there. And there's Alistair over here. So this is one of these uh, bioherms, as they're called. Someone's chatting, what they're saying. Metamorphic grade. Uh, the whole of the Dalradion Isla is fairly low grade. It's sort of a uh, green schist fasces, chlorite to biotite zone. Um, Alistair. Yes, I would say all of it's, uh, none of it's higher than biotite zone. Okay, so does that answer the question? Anyway, if it, it, it's low grade metamorphism. Um, um, okay, that's fine. Someone said thank you. Call it uh, Bob. Okay, so let's um, let's move on a little. Let's look, look around a bit more. So we've seen this this one here. Um, oh, and here's Ian as well, standing on top here, eating a sandwich. And here's them, some of these bioherms again. So we're seeing some quite large features. So it's good. It's interesting to have a look in a bit more detail at the at, the, at these as you get. Um, here's some. Here's one that's been sort of uh, cut by the sea and cut across. You can see some of the sort of. Uh, the lamination, lamin, lamina features inside here. With these sort of growth columns of the thing grew up. And here we actually have some sort of late, later stage veining of quartz and calcite that seems to have come along the layers and accentuated the layers. So sometimes the layers get accentuated, but this is actually a, a sort of vein filling that's sort of that's going between the, between the layers, uh, between the sort of biostrome layers. And I think this slide, I'm hoping Ian will just chip in here, but I think, he, I think some of, sometimes you get thick and thicker, wedge, thicker veins on one side or the other it, it, because there's been a little bit of tectonic extension in this direction. Ian, are you on? And you maybe comment on that? Um, uh, uh, yes, David. Um, these... Um, yeah, welcome, um, Ian. Thank you for the, coming in. Uh, yeah, these, um, these quartz um, veins, which, which show up the bedding really very nicely, um, are, are, are uh, reflect extension during the main tectonic deformation. So sometimes you just get you just get them on the side of the stromatolite, which is um, more favourably orientated. So on the on the right hand side here, they're, they're kind of better developed um, yes. than on the yes. left of, of, of a man. Yes. And the, the quartz crystals inside them are sometimes uh, to show uh, an elongation. Yes, um, and are kind of interfingering with uh, with calcite. Uh, so they're a type of vein that was sort of um, the significance of them was realised by the famous structural geologist John Ramsey, and uh, uh, so he he defined different sorts of um, uh, extensional veins, antitaxial and syntaxial uh, veins, and you, you get them a lot. In Alpine geology shows this sort of thing uh, uh, quite a lot. Okay. Well, thanks Ian. thanks, Ian, for that. And I'll probably ask you some more questions later on as we go on, if you don't mind. Um, that would be good. I remember that I, I took this picture because I was there with you and, and you explained all that to me, but it's good to have, a, have it re explained again. Thank you. Um, so that bed of bed with all the stromatolites, and if you actually walk around the corner here, around this little promontory, you suddenly you, you find that the whole thing, the whole bed is this bed of hummocky, mounds here so it's quite an extensive uh, area of uh, of, uh, of biohermal development and then you come round the corner we're still seeing more of these things yeah and you come round the corner some more it has the same bed and they're a bit more isolated here you've got one here and then here another one here and it's the same stratigraphic level and I believe my understanding of this that this sand layer here so half a meter of sand drapes over all these things and it probably snuffed them out it was probably a storm deposit quite a significant deposit and this beautiful stromatolytic sort of area suddenly got uh, sort of wiped out by a by a storm sand is that probably right ian it's gone no <laughs> sorry i didn't unmute myself uh, yes, that's right. You, you, you do indeed um, uh, see uh, situations where there's um, a storm deposit of some kind seems to have just sort of smothered the surface of the 
uh, of, of the stomatolites. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But sometimes the stomatolites can keep growing if there's a more continuous um, agitated environment and sometimes you get cross-bedded sands and, and uh, stomatolites kind of growing up together. Um, and there are modern environments in the Bahamas where, where, where that sort of thing uh, happens as well. But um, yeah, a smothering storm of fine sediment, not, not much fun. Yeah. Okay, so uh, thanks, Ian. Um, I'm going to come back to you in a second because I'm going to show a picture of yours in a second. Um, but this is this 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 diagram starts to show some of the other facies, sedimentary facies that we see in this member three here. So we've got the stromatolytic layer um, in here, and a sand layer that's covered it. And there's a there's a sort of sand here. It's whitish because it's actually been cleaned by the sea. This is so normally these this this is its normal fresh color. So we've got a sand unit down at the bottom here. Um, a, a biostrome layer uh, in here, uh, biostromes and bioherms, and then we've got uh, uh, perhaps some more sand in here, and then a, what Ian would call a layered facies, where you've got these little layers of uh, sort of yellowish and greyish rock, and then another sand at the top. So we've got, I think Ian de described, well Ian does describe three key facies, a sandstone facies, a layered facies, and he's divided that into several different types because you can see there there's several different types of rock in this layered facies and the stromatolytic facies and I think the next slide is a pinch pinch out of uh, Ian's guide yes here we are so here's a here's uh, here's a picture of the, the stromatolytic stuff and I mentioned bioherm and biostrom in two different techniques so a bioherm is a sort of a discrete mound and a biostrom is, a, is more of a layer with sort of individual columns so when they grow together they sort of amass into a layer uh, the sandstone facies is a lot of cross bedding, some ripples, um, and some sort of rip up class and things like that. Um, so we get, in the, and that's the sort of sandstone unit. And then this, 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 these three pictures here in C, the layered facies are different things. And we're going to see examples of all these sorts of things uh, with this sort of a flake uh, pocket, flake pockets, I think Ian calls them. Um, there's these graded beds and these are so these are the yellow stripy stuff is the this stuff the gray cross bedded sands are this stuff and the stratolites are that and that's the basic story Ian I'm sure I'll chip in if he, th if he thinks I'm talking rubbish so I think this is a nice picture of the uh, of the layered facies and we see different layers we see some siltstone sandstones dolomitic muds and this is one of Ian's flake pockets where there's a sort of a desiccation crack and flakes some of these dolomitic muds have got biofilms on them and then a storm comes and, and rips up the, the flakes, rips up the, the layer into flakes and they can fill little pockets and little desecration hollows and that sort of thing. Then you get some sand units sitting on top of it back to muds and it sort of varies, it's a whole alternation of varying, lots of varying mythologies of, uh, of dolomitic mudstone, siltstone, sandstone and a lot, probably quite a lot of storm activity on this. So we're talking a, probably a a sort of shallow marine situation uh, where, where, where storms can affect the sediments. So, um, and obviously the stratolites like shallow water too, because they need to be in the sort of uh, in the sunlit area as well. So we're talking shallow shallow water. Here's some more. Um, now, I believe we're seeing some loading here. We're seeing some shrinkage cracks, possibly filled with do dolom dolomitic mud. Um, so, all sorts of different things are going on here. Maybe Ian, you want to just talk to this picture a little bit? Um, yes, this will be another example um, of this, this fascist that shows these flake pockets. Um, you can see a couple of flake pockets in the centre. Can, can you point to where you think they are? Um, one there, that's right, yeah, one big one here. A bit lower down. Yeah. Um, now the, the flakes were would originally be made of dolomite, so you might think that they should look orange in colour, which is the, what the dolomite looks like, there's lots of iron in it, but they've been partly silicified, and that's why they're, they're sticking out um, in the same way that the sands uh, layers also stick out on this outcrop. Um, and the other distinctive thing, uh, and so th this particular uh, type of fasces then is very distinctive because the dolomite layers, they're actually quite pure. So they're, they're in this sort of yellow colour. It's a very pure dolomite, just a little bit of sand in it. Um, and the bed tops are irregular. Now that's where I think that they're desiccated and eroded. Mm -hmm. So if you move your pointer along one of the bed's tops. Here. Or along the, there, yes. I mean, there's a bit there. It looks as though it's a, it's a big chunk of it. It's maybe starting to be eroded. In and here. then if you go to the right, you can follow it down. And that's probably a desiccation stru structure that's been enlarged. Yeah. Um, 
so as you as you go and look at these beds they're, they're all, they've all got these irregular tops and then they have these derived flakes which i think are reflecting this desiccated um surface so so this is uh, i'm interpreting this some kind of lagoon environment where on the margins you you're not getting uh, clay coming in you're just getting a, a chemical precipitate and it and it's um becoming desiccated whereas we'll see another a different um example of this layer of is where it's much more uh, rich in organic matter and, and clay and, and it and yeah. doesn't ever dissipate yeah i think we see some of that later on yes great okay i'll just move on um that's brilliant um let's press the right button now i was looking this one i think when i was there with you ian you said this might be some sort of polygonal cracking i'm not sure whether you whether this is the top surface of one of these dolomitic yeah uh, yeah you, you could you can follow the point yeah move the pointer around and see if you can describe some polygons um uh it uh yes uh, when you're there it, it, you can be convinced you'd be half convinced by the photo i think Okay, I, I know that I took that picture with you there because I, I know that's what you said it was. And I, and I, and as you say, it's quite convincing the field. The photograph looks a bit less convincing, but nevertheless, this is the top surface on those dolomitic, sort of yellow dolomitic muddy units. And uh, as you say, it's quite pure dolomite. And, it's, and it maybe these are, the, these are the, the vertical plan view of the, uh, of, of the shrinkage cracks. This is another picture of the layered fasces. I, I suspect this is low, is this loading, Ian? Yes, I think that is. Yes, you're following along there, and you've got quite an. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, this this really puzzled me a lot. Actually, my my supervisor, who knew nothing about the diradian, um, is the, the key thing he what in the field. He actually sorted out for me what all these different bed contacts were. He was very good on sedimentary structures, and so what you got there, that interface, is is a very sort of convoluted in, in uh, and if you cut um hand specimens you see that there are several layers that are loaded downwards by gravity uh, into the underlying layer so it's not actually eroded it's actually loaded down but yes from a, from a distance you might say oh that's obviously another eroded layer but it's actually of a different origin okay so it's a, it's a soft it's a, set, it's a sediment soft sediment deformation yeah. feature yeah yeah okay cool and then in the sandstone facets because some of the areas are quite rippled um this is quite large rip scale rippling in in the in, in one of the sandstone units, and uh, where the waves have cut through it, you see some lovely uh, lovely ripple effects as well. Ripples here, so uh, lots of things going on in the in terms of sedimentology. Again, all sorts of things suggesting shallow a shallow marine setting. Then uh, I think it is Ian's feet. Uh, just be, just beyond the stromatolites and the ripples, we find this sort of grey greyish sandstone. Uh, siltstone unit with these pinkish sort of blobs in it and these are sort of pink calcite which we believe are pseudomorphs after anhydrite nodules and that's still still the belief Ian Alistair? Uh, yes and uh, and one of the sort of um, things that's distinctive is that there is pyrite uh, in them which is uh, presumably where the some of the sulfur went to um, post depositionally um, but they've certainly got the morphology of anhydrite nodules, but they're, they're not, they haven't, I mean, the most famous modern ones like this are occurring sabkas and are super tidal, but um, these appear, are not actually in sabkas. And um, they're, 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 it's, it's a hypersaline um, setting, but it's, it seems to be shallow subtidal. Um, but I mean, there are, there are, yeah, there are lots of examples in the geological record of anhydrite nodules in. In, yeah. in different circumstances but, but these are now yes you say these are these are once anhydrite nodules which is calcium sulfate yeah. and they're now calcite and, yeah. the, and you say the sulfur part of it may have gone That's into right. some pyrite well, That's well, when, when i originally studied here uh, i didn't like that idea uh, partly because somebody else suggested it and <laughs> but then the thing that uh, made me realize how wrong i was was that when i went to east greenland and there is an amazing formation in east greenland called the canyon formation and the at the top of it it shallows up to um uh, shallow water setting and the fasces there are absolutely identical to member three they're Very all good. there all the different layered fasces the sandstone fasces the spike line, they're just exactly the same mm -hmm. and what we've got there are chirp nodules with anhydrite inclusions in so we've got everything including these in this in this greenland uh, formation right um, so it's yeah <laughs> okay right uh, can i chip in Dave? 
Yeah, you chip in, Alistair, yeah. Um, uh, so, I mean, I've, analyzed, I've had a look at these guys in the thin section, and they actually contain both calcite and bearite. Mm. And I'd like Ian's take on why there's bearite in them. Um, yes, so, but, um, I mean, it's not uncommon to find bearite as a diagenetic um, precipitate uh, in, in, in rocks that have, uh, in, well, in, because of circulating brines post depositionally, um, there is bear, again in these Greenland ones. Yes, there is a bit of bearite in in those as well. Uh, so there's always some barium lurking around in the in, in the post depositional waters, particularly saline waters. Okay, right. We'll move on in the interest of time. These are, these are in the same unit, and I know Alistair had a student looking at some of these things, so there was a, a sort of thought at some stage that they might be ickyite. I'm not sure you're still on that case, are you, Alistair? No, and that's a different rock. Okay. All right, I'll look. I'll, uh, yeah, but there are some strange features in here. I'll, maybe we'll just pass on that. There's, there's certainly uh, some layers of here that have come into the, and, and uh, maybe, maybe paralleling the cleavage. I think we'll look at some look at those a bit later on as well. Um, we're leaving those behind uh, on the cliff behind us as we walk along. There's the, they're actually the bias, the bio, this is actually a, a four meter thick biostrome unit right across here. So some significant thicknesses of, uh, of stromatolytic limestone carbonate up in the cliffs here. So we were looking at a unit down at the, down at the, down at the sort of beach level, uh, but the cliff behind us has got, so we're talking about maybe I think the whole of the formations about a hundred or so meters thick um so you know this is this is one of the thick developments of the uh von Harvard dolomite member three and we're looking here now from from this locality towards the next locality and there's a very prominent sort of a sort of strange horizon over here we're going to have a look at as we get closer so we're now walking along this sort of dramatic coastline uh, dicking in and dipping in and out of these sort of bays and dipping around little headlands and in and out of dikes and little bays and and eventually coming up onto the, up onto here. So it's a very picturesque sort of area, enjoy, very enjoyable place to to have a stroll. So we get to what I call locality four on the map. Um, I'm going to try and just see if I can find my um, my map. Um, nope. I'm not going to find it. I'm going to stay where I was. Um, um, I've lost it. I've lost my. I was trying to. Sh I'm getting confused with the technology. I was trying to show you a map, but uh, I won't. Okay, so we get nearer this locality with the sort of uh, strange feature on it here. It looks like sort of great big, great big sort of ripples in, from a distance, but they're very big. And when you get on top of them, they're like this. They look like great big sausages in a sandstone. Um, if you look at it from the side, they're quite distinctive. Um, and and underneath it. There's a lot of lot of sort of brecciated stuff as well. So some very strange rocks. I haven't. I wasn't there with Ian or Alistair when we saw these the first time round. So I, I, and, uh, but Ian does refer to them into your book, and you do call them large a large set of ripples. But they're they're quite quite big and quite yes. They're they're, they're a one off. Um, they've got a wavelength of about fifty centimeters. Um, I think they're wave generated, but they're uh, within the sandstone patches, which mostly has tides. Um, tidal prospecting indicating strong tidal currents but the, the, evidently the environment was subject to storms as well um, and so it must have been a pretty severe storm to, to form wave ripples that big. Yeah. Um, if you've got coarser sediment you can have bigger uh, ripples like that. Maybe. Yeah so some of this is quite coarse yeah yeah yeah, yeah. very it's a very it's a very picturesque sort of place. Uh, yeah. Um, now this this facies here I this is where you're getting those were the things I mistook for ekites. They're gypsum. I've, they've got they they actually even have um, anhydrite crystals inside of them. And look at them in the microscope. 
Okay, so these are these are these sort of strange strange pseudomorphs here, which which, which we believe that they're 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 pseudomorphs after gypsum, yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. So we've got our hydrate nodules and then some perhaps some gypsum crystals here. That, what the, the, is the orientation to do with uh, some sort of rotation into the into a sort of cleavage direction? They're all parallel to the cleavage on the uh, across the island anticline, so I think they probably are. Um, right across the, you see that they all have the same angle right across. Yeah, yeah. I've got some pictures of those coming up, and a bit more obvious ones. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, it seems to me. Sorry, in, in that in that picture, you've got two different things there. Um, back, the, yeah. the, 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 the gypsum pseudomorphs that uh, Alistair mentioned that were actually something I, I hadn't. Um, hadn't recognised, but it seems a, a, a good, good interpretation. Um, but then to, to the right, there's there are things. I, I was wondering whether some of the other things are actually sediment fills of cracks, and are these um, you know, sort of shrinkage cracks uh, structures? I wonder whether you're, you're getting them both in the same in the same yeah, yeah. Uh, outcrop. When both in both cases they'd be rotated towards the cleavage during deformation. I think gypsum can form like that. These are also gypsum. These are really, really good examples. Oh yes, yeah. Yes, because mm -hmm. obviously bedding. This is bedding, but all these things do have a do have a sort of do have an orientation in this sort of angle. Yeah. Yeah, I don't remember ever seeing that outcrop. Looks really nice. Yeah, I got uh, another picture from further on as well um, of the same sorts of feature. I'll come out. I'll pick up that later. Okay. Can I say uh, something? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, about the previous picture. Um, these are beautiful. These things are a beautiful example because someone raised the question about the metamorphism here. Um, these are former gypsums and uh, I've cut a few of them and they're actually hollow. There's pore, they still have the fluid in them, which tells us the metamorphism hasn't affected these rocks. And this is a wonderful example where a dry rock, a rock that's never seen a fluid, doesn't experience metamorphism. So this rock, although it's been to middle green schist fasces, has never actually experienced it because it's completely impermeable. I leave you now. Brilliant. Well, that's that's something I didn't know. But yeah, I mean, there, there are tons of Isla that must have escaped bits of it because there's some bits of the geology on Isla in the Dalradian that doesn't look like it's any, been anywhere near a, meta, any, a metamorphic event. And this is a good example of one. But there's certainly a lineation here, so there must have been some sort of tectonics pushing them into um, some sort of orientation, yes, I guess. Absolutely, but the tectonics are, I mean, you can, you can mold a rock without letting a fluid in. And this one has not, this one has not experienced fluid flow. Those gypsum clips would not be there, and they would not have, the, those little pockets would have been gone. So it's a, this is a beautifully preserved rock. Um, I, when I saw that, I was completely amazed. I didn't, I didn't know rocks could survive metamorphism that well. Brilliant. Okay, we learn something every day. Thank you, Alistair. Um, further on, the, uh, there's quite a lot of reddening in a, in a rock. This is a sort of this is a sort of breccia horizon here, and it's got it's got a lot of uh, a lot of redness in it. And and there's actually a whole red reddened unit here of the the of a sort of dolomitic sort of breccia, and you and you can see it run across the beach here and goes up the cliff. And this is actually the boundary between the um, the, the, the member three dolomites that we've been stuff, the stuff we've been looking at, and the and, uh, and the next outcrop of the Jura quartzite. And, and this this fault is this is a fault, and it's the reddening is as some of the people who saw my Isla talk last uh, last week was the uh, it's probably because this is a certainly a, uh, almost certainly a Mesozoic fault. Uh, in the Triassic or something that is that is actually causing this reddening and uh, forming the boundary between the, the Bonnerhaven formation and the Jura quartzite formation. So uh, perhaps a, a later fault. So we'll move on to locality five through the Jura quartzite. The next, this is, this is all the Jura quartzite, some lovely dikes and tertiary 60 million old dikes. And the next bit of the coastline is sort of uh, there's quite a lot of these dikes sticking up. It makes it quite a spectacular walk. Again, we've walked through and around these 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 uh, these features. Um, the, the, a lot of caves here uh, in the quartzite. This one, you you walk into the cave. There's a person walking in, 
and looking around and you can walk out again. It's like a, almost a sea, like a sea arch. You can, uh, and it's quite a spectacular sort of setting in, in, in this cave. And also there's some defamation going on in the Jura courts. Again, I remember I said earlier on, we were looking at what does happen to a very th thick, competent layer of, uh, of bedded met sandstones when you deform them and you get these, uh, these beautiful sort of asymmetric fold, this beautiful asymmetric fold um, in, the, in, in the Jura court site on this cliff, edge of this cliff. So we walk on further, another, another, yet another beach, and we're going to walk up through this little, uh, walk up through this little um, valley here and look at the rocks on the, on, the, on the edge of this valley. So this is on the southwest side of Porto Cotain. And this is sort of big sort of promontory sticking out with a strange sort of bedding in the Jura court site. And when you look at it from the side, it's sort of got sort of an angle to the bedding. If this is the bedding, and it's got this strange angle to it. Um, and looking like this. And, and I was there with, and with Roger and we certainly thought it could have been, it could be deformed cross bedding in, the, in a very, very large cross bedded set that's been deformed by some sort of liquefac liquefaction event, possibly earthquake triggered and has caused some defamation of this, uh, of this cross bedded unit. So a big deformed cross bedded set, it seems to be what we interpret this as. And that's looking back down on it as we're looking to where we've just been uh, down in here through the caves. And there's the deformed cross bedded unit as we come up this slope here. Um, you can start to see some of the glacial features here. We've got this sort of, uh, we've got this cliff line and then the upper cliff line. And, uh, and I'll refer to this, talk, talk, this, talk about this in a few minutes time. But this is known as the, the backing cliff to the high rock platform. And this is the backing cliff to the main rock platform. So there are two platforms here and then you've got this this is the sort of this is the, this is known as the main rock platform which is and these cliffs were probably cut in the younger Dryas and about 11,500 this cliff may date back to pre-glacial times it's till covered this is this till on this surface here and shingled bit shingled gravels beach gravels and till on here and then it's cut by this cliff line and then there's a lower a lower beach system down here um, at the south end of Border Cotain, we actually find the contact again between the Jura Quartz site on the top of this stack and some cleave meta mudstones at the bottom at the top of member four. So we're actually, the stratigraphy now is sort of, we're back into the, uh, we, we, we've got in Border Cotain, we actually have a, um, a, 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 a sort of, we're, we're moving on to the next bit of the anticline and we see the next core, which is see, we're going back into the underlying Bonahav and Dolomite in the top of member four. And there's the stack where I saw that here. And then here is our white Dolomite again. So the, the layer cake stratigraphy is, is working for us here. So we've got uh, the, white, the white Dolomite in member four uh, in the middle of the bay here. And just around the corner, just around the corner is still some big caves. Um, so this is, uh, this is lunchtime. This is a classic pose of a Swedish geologist. Um, having his uh, snooze at lunchtime. This is Alistair's party. Um, and these caves are, have been, they're known as the Balsa Caves locally and they've been inhabited for a long time and um, quite a popular place for sort of uh, beach parties and things. But it's a long walk to get here to have a party. Um, Porto Hotain is, um, translates as Cotton Bay because there was a ship laden with cotton uh, wrecked there. Brilliant. I never knew that. All right. Well, this is the back of the bay. So this is Cotton Bay. Yeah. Okay. So this is the back of the bay. This is the raised cliff line here, here, and this is uh, the back of the, uh, the, 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 the high rock, the back of the high rock platform at the back here. So we're going to walk out of the bay. Uh, here's the bay. Um, and we're going to walk out up this little slope here. How are we doing for time? I'm just going to check the time here. How are we doing? Right. Um, so on the north side, of we come up here, um, and there's some. Uh, this is still member four with a bit of dolomite in it and some sandstones, and then we come up onto the top, and then you've got quite a nice view of this uh, two platforms: the the main the main rock platform here, and then the high rock platform or the high rock the backing cliff to the platform. This is the, this is the platform. This is the backing cliff. This is the platform. This is the backing cliff. So backing cliff to main rock platform, younger Dryas. And this is probably pre-Pleistocene, pre, pre may even be Pliocene. 
um, age, which is run. And there's Malabalsa where we started in the distance looking west. So we move on. This is a little cartoon I drew. Uh, I showed if people went, came on my sea kayak trip to the west coast of Jura to try and show this formation of the uh, of the uh, Pliocene uh, strand plain and the, and the backing cliff to the high rock platform. Glaciation deposits a till. The sea level then rises and then it starts to fall into the Loch Lomond re-advance or the Younger Dryas, forms the caves. There's a period of a sort of still stand here. Um, and that's when the caves were formed. Then, then the, we get the, the a sea level rise, a flooding of the caves, to, uh, the reworking of all the debris into, into a beach, and then the sea level falls and, and leaves these caves stranded. But people sometimes think that these caves were formed at the Flandrian Tregression, i.e. at the end of the, at the beginning of the Holocene. They're not, they're probably older. So they're not 6,000 year old caves. They're actually about 11,000 years uh, at the Lot Roman re So they've got quite a nice little sort of story glacial sort of geomorphological story going on here turn you know to the current position that we have here with this complicated set of sort of stacks and beaches caves raised beaches at the top uh, two different platforms yeah and a modern beach so quite a nice little story of sea level change and glaciation and erosion just a nice few pictures of uh, as we move away from Horticotane um nice back into the back into member three uh dolomites again and this is a picture eddie lynch i think took gave me but this is another one of these uh rotated uh presumably these are the, these again these gypsum crystals yeah i guess that's what they are rotate yeah i guess so but i've never seen them before they're really good now, this is a lovely picture and I was given this by one of the guys from the Highland Geological Society who went there and uh, said he found these beautiful things. What were they? Yeah. Yes, I don't recall having seen them either. Um, but one interesting thing about this bay is that uh, we know that at the eastern end of the bay, the level of beach sand has dropped by some meters over the decades. Um, because Bruce Lavelle has, has worked now on the contact with the Jura Corp site on the east side of the bay, um, and it, it's, it wasn't exposed when I was there um, uh, in, in the 1970s. And in fact, uh, when the survey were there around 1900, I think it must have been um, unexposed because they put a big fault in, and it's very obviously a sedimentary contact now. Yeah, yes, I mean, it yeah, I mean, I mean, my experience of Isla beaches is that you can, I mean, Salago Bay is my favorite beach on Isla. And one, one, after one winter, all the sand went. It was just completely rock, you know, just bed, bed. And now you go there today and there's 20 meters of sand on it. So, yeah, things change quite quickly in the storms. Um, then we get to some lovely, uh, lovely dikes. This is a big dike sticking out to sea here, seabird nests and perches on it, cutting right through these. Uh, these member three dolomites and you're looking back here again you can see just just another scenic view of Malabalsa and the, and, the, and the platforms here and I looked at this when I first saw this I thought this was a biohome but it may just be a fold I think Ian is that, is that just a just a just a tectonic fold um yes I think so yeah yeah okay so you've got a small fold here um but you say not a lot of deformation really you know this is this is Alistair's point isn't it so we move on to locality six we've got another one of these big dikes here and there's some lovely exposures in the sort of on the sort of western side of this thing you can see a whole succession going up the cliff here and you have to climb up through this little cliff this little cliff to get round it this is one of the classic dike dike exposures on Isla and there's some beautiful sort of rocks in the in this in, in this section because you could just walk right up this section and climb out over this over this thing at low tide you can actually walk through here and this is why this is called the bay of the doors because you can walk through these dikes there's a lovely uh sort of a recent uh breaking of a of a of a white white sort of uh, layer here which when you look at it is just full of stromatolite this is just beautifully uh in, in a sort of white cal picked out in a sort of white calcite um, um it's not the yellow dolomitic so it seems to be very white this one and then there's some, I believe these are, these are 
Shrinkage cracks filled with sand, is that right? Um, the, the, this is sandstone patches, I think. It's just got some thick dolomite beds at the base, which are desiccating. And the, the, the cracks uh, filled with sand go very deep down into the bed. Yes, got this, so this sand, you say this sand yeah. unit here is sort of filtered right down yeah. into, the, into the lower unit, yeah. I mean, we haven't really looked at sort of the subatrius shrinkage catch, which tends to be narrower and, and smaller in, in the layer patches. But this is, um, yeah, this is good sandstone patches. So uh, in the upper part of the view, you've got some cross stratification some cross stratification uh, in that uh, sandstone there. Yes, there's, I think above it, there's some beautiful, this is, yeah, as you were just saying, there's some beautiful cross stratification. Yeah, that's, that's the best outcrop of all, yes. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Um, and and it, it has lots of wonderful things here. Um, the uh, orangey dolomite, you can see there's, there's a layer that's weathering in near yeah. the top of your, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, just uh, along there. Um, and then there are some interclass eroded from a bed like that just above. Um, in here, yes. Uh, in, in, just in the top sandstone, yeah. Yeah, so, so these, we, these pieces have come out of this unit. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's another one. Um, yeah. And, yeah. and there is a place in this outcrop where you where there's you can actually see the shape of a small dune uh, preserve where it's been draped by uh, a dolomite layer that's formed when when the water was still. Yeah, um, I need I need to put that on my list to photograph next time. But I did yeah, I've never found it. Yeah, it's near the bottom of the outcrop. Uh, but I mean, the the, the way that it's uh, weathered out here is just really important. Yeah. And uh, and are these the surfaces of ripples here as well? Yeah. That's right, those are wave ripples just there, the symmetrical. Yeah. Um, now, some of these sandstones uh, do have oids in them. In fact, there's one a, bit, a little bit um, higher up in the succession than, than this bed, uh, which is mostly oolitic. Um, those beds are not so well exposed, but when you find them, they're really quite exciting. Yes, yeah, so I haven't found the oolitic. That's my next task as well on my list to go and find the oolitic beds. Yeah, because it yet. They're, when they deform, they're absolutely amazing to, because you can get oids replaced by silica and then silica grows on the ends as the rock is extended during, during the metamorphism. But right. the, the, the circular, there's still got circular um, trains of inclusions of dolomite inside, showing that it's, it's not deformed inside to form the rock. So there's, yeah, there's lots to see, keep going back. Okay. Um, yeah, classic sort of picture of the dike. This is the one we had to climb up round, but in low tide you can actually, spring tide you can actually get through this door here and walk around, but sometimes you have to climb round it, yeah. And then this is the view from the top of it looking back down the wall here and we're moving into the next little bay, which is bay and uh, I think that means the two doors, I'm not sure. Yes. Yeah, and so this is a beautiful sandy bay we're in the top eight, the top of the member three here, um, and member four dolomites are in the back. Uh, we do get some member four dolomites in the Jura quartzite again at the far back end of this bay here. Um, and some some of the member three units, sandy bit, sand units, have got these fantastic rippled surfaces. Um, there's the dike going out to sea again, beautiful ripple surfaces, and in detail, you sort of see this as you walk along. It's really nice to walk on. And this is, I believe, a sort of car, a sort of dolomitic mudstone, thin malaya, and these are polygonal filled cracks again, Ian, am I right? That's right, yes, they, 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 don't, tend, they don't form complete polygons, they're incomplete and the, the cracks taper out sideways. Um, so the morphology is a bit different from um, what I would describe as desiccated structures, and they're also not associated with interclass. Um, and they occur in this, it's much, the darker material, um, which I think was in a sub in a subaqueous environment, an environment that wasn't uh, subjected to desiccation, and, and that has higher amounts of organic matter in. Yeah, so there's organic. There's all, this is organic rich Absolutely. sort of muddy layer, than then it's cracking in a, yeah. in a sort of. This is a yeah. just a, to confuse people. This is a plan. I'm looking down here. My camera's looking straight down onto the rock. Um, so this is looking. This is not a cross section. This is a vertical uh, plan view of this. Uh, of this, of this sort of cracking, yeah. And then this one, which again, I think is, I think I've got, this is a block, but I think it's the right way around. And these are sort of going into the, the these sands going back, injected down into the layers below. 
where I got that, this upside yeah, you, down. Yeah, you see, you seem that's right. You do seem to have layers going both directions, both yeah. up and down. Um, I span this. This is a block, and I span it around. I couldn't work out which way round it was. I was fiddling with it just before we started because there's some really strange structures in this. Yes. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, structures of this sort are often called subacreous shrinkage cracks, and they're and they're not really properly understood. There are, there are various different mechanisms by which they could form in relation to fluctuating conditions. And Jeff Tanner has um, talked about some structures that look a bit like this lower down in the Brunnenhof formation at Kaliga, and refers to them as um, uh, as, as related to um, uh, Inject sand injection during burial. Mm -hmm. um, so we've, we've got several possible different um, different mechanisms um, for, for these things, but it, it, you do see them in, in quite a few different um, Neoproterozoic, you know, Precambrian sedimentary successions. You see structures that you don't see in younger uh, deposits. Yes, because you've got a different ocean, a different water chemistry, haven't you? I mean, you, you, you see things like molar teeth structures as well, and they're not seen anywhere else except the near Proterozoic. So there's some strange things happening. We can't assume that the current water we see today and the current conditions are like, like it was 650 million years ago. Yeah. Someone else is chatting to me. What do they want to say? Oh, someone has to go. All right, sorry. have to go. That's fine. Let's move on a wee bit. Um, uh, there was a question, the, the question from Andy Moffat um, in the group chat uh, saying the gypsum and hydrocrystals would appear to be more resistant to erosion in the rock. Yes, because they're, 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 um, they're, they're largely silicified now, that, that's why they're, they're, they're sticking out. Okay, so we're, near, we're in the bay here and again we found our white dolomite again. So it's, lithotrophography is working here for us here. This is the third time we've seen it. We saw it at the beginning at Port Anstruthane, we saw it at Port Ahotane, and now we're seeing it in Bay Andalus. So we're seeing this white dolomite, and this is the Jura quartzite uh, above it. Yeah, so we're very close to the top of the uh, of the unit. And in fact, here is the top of the member four and the Jura quartzite. I think I've got my stick pretty much on the boundary here. So I think this is runs along here. So the cliff is the Jura quartzite, and this these rocks in the foreground are the sort of sort of with this crude space cleavage and a sort of metasilt stone here of the uh, of member top of member four. Um, I just threw this in and um, we can have a quick chat now about sort of things like carbon isotopes stratigraphy. Um, this is a composite of uh, uh, carbon isotopes in the before the Port Askeg tillite where we get this sort of feature here and it includes Garvelak Highlands. Some I've got some more missing data I haven't put in here from Alistair's latest work. The Bonnerhaven Dolomite which is what I was interested in is uh, shows fairly for member three shows fairly sort of negative carbon isotopes. Um, and yet member four seems to have very positive ones here. And so there's a sort of strange sort of uh, profile in this. And this all leads into the discussions about whether the Bonnerhaven dolomite is some sort of cap to the, the, the glaciation. Um, the, the, the issues are all sorts of things like, well, it's a lot long way from the dolomite, from the carbonate to the actual tillite itself. Does this carbon isotope negative incursion? Does it, you know, is it, does it, is it similar to the, the things we see um, worldwide with the with the Sturtian? And it, it, you know, so there is a, you know, there, there has been talk about the Bonnerhaven dolomite being a cap carbonate, but it, it's not a. If you saw cap carbonates elsewhere, they don't look like the Bonnerhaven dolomite. So, uh, so I don't know if any Ian or. Tony or uh, Alistair want to chip in here and, and have a bit of a discussion about uh, cap carbonates. Um, there are, you've got a couple of different ice ages shown on your diagram here, the Sturtian glaciation and the Marinoan glaciation. Um, and the diagram, uh, what you've got there is cryogenian. In fact, now, um, begins around 720 million years. That's actually a, an arbitrary change in definition that was yes. made uh, quite recently. Um, but what we think now is that the worldwide uh, glaciation arrived at seven, about 716 million years. Yeah, about here. So it was dirty in one. Um, then there was a gap after that glaciation, and then we had the second glaciation, the Maranoan. Now, um, you're showing us variations in carbon isotopes there. 
the problem with trying to correlate using carbon isotopes is there's so many similar uh, anomalies. Um, I, I would put more weight on strontium isotopes, which systematically um, increase through much of the near Proterozoic. And on that base, basis, confidently um, assign the Portaske glaciation to the strontium. And then if we have that in mind, say, well, what do cap carbonates look like above the strontium? Mm -hmm. They actually look a bit different from those above the Maranoan. Yes, that's um, easy, yeah. So they, they are um, typically offshore uh, carbonates, um, and the sturgeon deposits are often um, uh, are, uh, are shallow marine in, 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 many, in many cases. Um, so the, the, the water levels are relatively high in the sturgeon and, and in the cap. And we think we've got what I would regard as a typical sturgeon cap actually in some dolomite beds that are uh, within the Portaske Tillai, within the, the quartzite unit at the, of the top of Portaske Tillai. Um, whereas the Bonard and Dolomite, as you say, isn't, isn't a typical cap because it's, it's really shallow, which isn't typical. So I think what's happening here in the Darwinian Basin, we've got uh, quite thick accumulation of sediments over this interval. And so we're seeing an evolution of environments within the cap uh, in a way that we're not seeing in most places worldwide. Yes, I've been with you and we've looked at some of the quartzite units at the top of the Port Askeg Tillite Formation and we found a dolomite in there which also has a negative carbon isotope signature and it's possible, as you say, that the, the, the true, right. the true yeah, cap, yeah. The cap carbonate it, it, to the map. It's minus five, which is exactly the same as the sturgeon cap in, in other, um, yeah. other parts of the world. So it still leaves a, an explanation as to what, what is this negative anomaly that we see in the Bonnerhaven dolomite member three. Often people look at negative carbon isotopes in carbonates and see, well, it was, uh, you know, if you equate it to temperature and things like that, you say, well, this is full of life. This is actually where all the stromatolites are, is in this negative isotope. And then the, the white dolomite of member yeah, four. The, the, the white dolomite is the really weird, weird it's thing. It's a weird one. It's I mean, very, very positive. It's completely off the scale uh, in, all, <laughs> in all terms. It just shouldn't, shouldn't exist. No. So... Um, my verdict of it was I thought this was a specific dolomite, a very pure one. It's very low in iron, and the iron will typically come from seawater because seawater will be reducing apart from a very uh, surface, the superficial layer. And when you get a storm, that, that some of that offshore um, uh, water below the surface is brought on shore, giving you lots of iron, and that's where I think the iron comes from in member three. But this member four dolomite hasn't, hasn't got any iron. And it seems to be kind of isolated in the sea. And I thought it was super tidal. And the only other evidence I had was that occasionally you had a few floating grains of quartz, which I thought might be wind blown. Uh, but otherwise, it's completely enigmatic. And its carbon isotope composition is just ridiculous. Um, and doesn't really fit with anything else. Yeah. No, I mean, so, I, there's been quite a lot, all the white dolomite exposures along the coast have all been sampled. I know Alistair has sampled it at Port and Struthane, where there's a lot of deformation and fluid flow and thinks that it could be a metamorphic signature. But, but, it, but the Port Cotain and here at Bay and Doris, it doesn't look very metamorph, very deformed, and it's still showing the same high positive value. So, as you say, it's a very strange deposit, this white dolomite without the iron. The I mean, the difficulty is actually getting a value. A normal value to change to such a, a positive value. Yeah. I mean, things don't normally work like that. <laughs> if it's not a metamorphic, the positive one cannot be metamorphic. Metamorphic shifts it the other way. The positive one is just as problematic, even if you add metamorphism to the picture. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Anyway, ge geology is brilliant because it always throws up questions that you're never going to, you know, you do you find out more questions than answers. Um, Okay, we have to leave the, the bay and we're going to walk home and we can have questions as we walk. We've got a long way home to go. We climb out of the bay. It's a nice, beautiful view looking back of where we've been uh, here. We've climbed up a, a sort of goat path uh, up through the cliff here. But the only way out of this bay is to climb this track uh, up through the quartzite. And you, you sort of pause here and have a last view of the, of the north coast of Isla from the telegraph pole, which is the last remaining telegraph pole of the old power line that went to Collinsey. Carried the power to Collinsey through here. This is the only, the only post left of it. Then we hit the Sound of Isla. It's Alistair pointing out the uh, the plunge direction of the anticline um, and the Papsajura in the background. 
and uh, I mentioned the deer. There are a lot of deer on the north, north side of Isla. I know states sort of uh, have a business in shooting these things, uh, but you will find them. They're quite tame. They come quite close to you. Um, this is the lighthouse at Ruval, looking, looking, uh, looking um, towards Jura. We're on the way home here, and here are the paps of Jura from, the, from an angle that you don't often see them. And I wanted to just quickly, I've got time, point out another glacial feature. You can see here this line here, here. Yeah, it's known as the, uh, the witch's slide or the old lady's slide. And if you sort of zoom in a bit on it, it looks like this. This is, this is the best example in the British Isles of a medial moraine. Yeah, and if you think the ice flowed around as it was flow around the, uh, the back of Benanur, the, the highest of the paps in two streams, one this way, one that way, and there was a big rock fall up here and it fell onto the glacier, um, but the glacier was, was, there was two glacial streams, one this side and one this side, and this rock fall went onto the ice and got transported down. And we know this is the high rock, this is the main rock platform backing cliff that we talked about earlier. This stops at that level, so we know it must be older than that because it's truncated by that. So this is, and it's, there's been some ex beryllium exposure dating done on this, and I'll talk a bit, bit about more of this when, when I take you to Jura. But this is, uh, this is probably around, this is probably around about 15,000 years ago. And this cliff line was formed in the, in the Younger Dryas at 11,000. Um, so a nice, a nice place, um, nice view of it, because you don't see it normally, because you never, you, uh, Port Askeg and Bonahaven, you don't see it, but you do see it from here. So here we are on our way back, uh, following these little, little trails uh, through the, the bracken and the heather. It's a long way. We've been out for nine hours now and Bunnerhaven Distillery is in sight. And I wanted to just quickly show something about whiskey in Bunnerhaven because Bunnerhaven Distillery takes its water for processing from a spring at Margadale. There's the river that we crossed and it, the, the spring comes out of the Dolomites. Yeah, and. Uh, and if you look at this sort of a uh, table of uh, um, chemical stuff, uh, chemical compositions of some of these waters, you can see that, uh, that the, the, the pH of the water that they're using in Bunnerhaven is much higher than the pH of the waters in the traditional Isla whiskies, of, uh, which is quite, quite low pHs, a sort of a nice acidic soft waters of Ardbeg, Kalila, but uh, Bunnerhaven is unusual on Isla that it has a relatively hard water because it's limestone. Uh, it comes from the limestone. Whether that makes a difference to the taste, who knows? But it's a good story that the water for Bunnerhaven is different to Kalila, which comes out of the lock here. Ardenho, the new distillery on Isla, is coming out of Ardenho lock. This is soft, soft, soft peaty water that's used for these distilleries and all, virtually all the other ones. Um, but Bunnerhaven is different and it is a different whiskey. Um, because it's pretty, pretty much unpeated. So, time for a dram. Cheers. Well done, David. So, we've, we've finished on time. Um, we've got a few minutes if you want any other, any other sort of questions. Uh, please unmute yourself and then mute yourself again so we don't get too much background noise. Um, if that's all for you want to hear, then thanks for listening. Um, hopefully, I'm hoping to do another one in a, in a week's time and to uh, Ben and Du on Isla uh, to see the base of the Port Askeg formation. So, uh, and I know a lot of uh, people like Alistair, Ian, Tony are experts in that tour. So if they want to join us next week, we'll, uh, we'll have a tour of Ben, a sort of virtual tour of, uh, of Ben and Du uh, and Ben Bui. Let's see what more chat people, anyone wants. Oh, just lots of thank yous. Anyone, anyone got any technical questions? Are you planning to put the recording somewhere? Yes, yeah, so well, I'll, I haven't done a recording yet, but I have recorded this and, I, and, and, I, and I've tried to set it up so that I can put it onto YouTube. So what I'll try and do is, uh, is put it onto, the, onto YouTube and put a link to it on the Glasgow Geological Society website, would probably be the easiest thing, yeah? So I hope you've enjoyed the walk. It was, uh, it was a tiring eight hours or eight or nine hours. I hope you're suitably exhausted. I'm about to crack um, a dram. I didn't have a bun and half. I've taken, I've taken all my whiskey from Isla. And I, I'm, I'm in Glasgow, not in Isla. But I do have a bottle of uh, Port Charlotte, uh, uh, Buchladdy Port Charlotte. So, uh, Chandibor.
Thank you. Any spells here? So, what are you drinking, Alistair? Um, I've got a uh, Kilcoman 2009. Yeah. I, I forgive me for not drinking Brunhaven, but I think it tastes like shite. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, Alistair lives in Sweden. All Swedish geologists, all Swedes, not just geologists, all Swedes love smoky whiskey. They don't, they sort of turn their noses up at things like Brunhaven, which is unpeated. But I, but uh, it's, a, it's quite a nice, it's quite a nice dram, but, uh, Again, it's unpeated and it's not, it's, it's, it's not Isla in, in some mm. sense. People expect Isla whiskies to be um, like this one here. This is, the, this is Brook Laddie's heavily peated malt, um, the Port Charlotte from Brook Laddie. And it's, uh, so there is a whiskey, I have a whisk, whiskey talk, that Bunnahaven slide was, was part of it because Alistair's given me some nice uh, chemical data on some of these whiskey waters. And uh, there's a nice story to be told about whiskey and water. Most of it's rubbish, but it's uh, it's good it's fun anyway. Right. <laughs> Cheers, Dave. Cheers, everybody. So Dave, when's the talk next week? Sorry, Alistair, did you just... I... Yeah, when's the talk next week? Well, I'm, I meant to do a little vote on it, but I'd never got the technology sorted out. Just so I was going to do it at the same time, but if people have objections to that, I think it's not a bad time to do it. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't really impact on the sort of anything you might want to do later. Um, so... Um, yeah, I'm gonna, I was going to do it next Thursday because people had th Thursday night is often the Glasgow Geological Society night. So Thursday night was was mentioned as a thing. So I'll do um, I do a, I'll do a virtual trip to uh, Ben and Bowie uh, next Thursday at six thirty uh, Scottish time, and uh, and on Angus Miller's GeoWalks website, I'm going to do a quick. Uh, a quick, quick talk on Jura and a quick talk on Collinsy for him as part of his lockdown lecture series. So they're on geo walks. Um, so I'll do the, the Jura and Collinsy ones, and then I'll uh, a sort of introductions to the islands. And then on the on my uh, Glasgow Society thing, I will do. Uh, I certainly would like to do. I'll do Ben and Bowie, and I'm thinking of doing a Collinsy group. One just concentrating on the Collinsy group, and one on the Rins. And one on South Isla, and one on South Isla with the with the with your metamorphic story. So I thought they would be a nice sort of set of of excursions on Isla that would tell some nice stories of the snowball Earth, the, the Dalradian sill metamorphic story on the south, and the opening of the Apatus, and then a Rins complex one and a Collinsy group one. Yeah, you should definitely do the Rins. That'd be really good. Be nice to hear you stu telling us all about the Reds. That would be super. You've well, I'll see if I can get. There. I'll get Simon on as well because I went there with Simon uh, Cuthbert recently, and so he's got a lot of new thoughts on some of the Rin stuff. So that will be be good to get to sort of uh, some experts as well as me talking about it. Yeah. And do I, you think you can get Tony to do one on the Garvelax for us? Well, th this is the, the this is I uh, just mentioned. Here. Tony, you're here. Oh, it's Tony. Yeah. Yeah, he's still here. Tony, would you do one on the Garvelax? Well, I was, what I suggested, I could put, up, put some pictures up and then I've, uh, I could sort of do the technology and, uh, and um, get the photographs up and then get Ian, uh, sorry, get Tony to do a commentary of the photographs, like rather like Ian's just done, you know, I'll sort of, I'll sort of facilitate it and then Tony can just... Who can you hear uh, you, can you hear me now? Yes, uh, yes, we can hear you, Tony. Yes, yeah, um, welcome. Well, this is the first time, the first time I've ever been in such a meeting. It, it seems to me it went exceptionally well. You showed us some wonderful photographs, which we could actually have a full technical discussion of. So this is definitely a way to go. Now, uh, Garvelux, yes, we have lots of material, but 
The one thing I take away from this um, meeting is this requires organization. You, I'm sure, spent quite a long time, you have shown us, in my guess, is something like 80 slides. 122. So, yeah, well, uh, my, my number was a lot less, a lot more than that. So, um, yeah, I greatly look forward to next week. I will try and participate more next week. But um, again, I, I, I don't want to make these comments uh, by voice. I'll send you a mail. It seems to me you've done a lot of work here. Now, just so that you hear this from me, my original mapping of these rocks in the 60s was no more than six, seven, eight days in the field. That's all I spent to write that article in the Scottish Journal of Geology. I used one to 10,000 scale Royal Air Force 1945 air photographs in black and white. You have vastly much better material available today. I am 100% sure that a, a vastly improved map could be made of these outcrops and a lot more would come out of it if it was. And it looks as though you've done a lot of the work necessary. So um, I just want to encourage you to, to do more, frankly. Uh, terrific. But I'll write it down. Thanks very much, David. Okay. Yes, I mean, I've certainly I've drawn, I've been drawing new maps. You can do a lot more uh, mapping with the new, uh, the new photographs and things. Yes, it's, uh, it's certainly uh, much better mapping. And, uh, and every time I go there, I add more to my map. So I've, I'm, I am producing a, a sort of map. I'm trying to find it almost. I mean, that's the sort of, that's the sort of where yes, I'm at. With yes, it, you yes, know, yes and, sure. And, and, yeah, and that's, that sort of, much you know and, and uh, that's based on all the work we've done using gps to make the to map the locations using aerial photographs and land, landsat stuff so we, you know we're building up a, a, a better picture of, of what's going on there yeah well i think that when i get home i'll 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 make a scan of my field map and you can then judge just how much better your field map is the, the, the starting point for Dave's mapping was my, uh, were my PhD maps, uh, which um, were mapped on enlarged aerial photographs, so one to 2,500. So they, um, I was able to get a huge amount of detail there's in Ian's, on there. There's Ian's map. Yeah. But, um, uh, but the, this, uh, they weren't also uh, referenced, and it was difficult to get them exactly right according to the national grid, the sort of problems that um, Tony uh, alluded to. So there's detail there, but the detail might not be in quite exactly the right place. Okay, anybody else got any comments on it? On the, on the, Yeah, I mean, I've just 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 brought this photograph back up. I was trying to sort of get this to show earlier, but you know, the quality of some of the modern uh, photography is, is is stunning. You know, you can there's so much you can see on these modern photographs. You know. Well, Tony, we'll have to do your St. Andrew's conference on Zoom as well, maybe. Mm. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> well, a, a, a sort of small mini pre-meeting pre yes, of it or yes. something. Yeah, just a mini one. Mini one. I mean, and I said, I said send you an email saying I was happy to help with the technology and uh, there are yeah. other people that can help as well. It might be quite, quite good to have a sort of uh, a, a, a chat about that at some stage if, you're, if you want the, to. The, the presentation next week on um, Ben and Weedy, um, have you got enough to, to occupy one hour? 
Oh, I think so. Yeah, I've got hundreds of pictures. I've been there about 20 times. So I've got pictures from every angle of every exposure. So yeah, I think, I think it's enough. Yeah. We can go down to the coast as well. And we can go on to um, uh, Ben Boriak as well. So I think it would just be, uh, it's just nice to take people there, you know, um, yeah. You've taken us out of ourselves, David, this grand, grand, grand word. Sorry, Ian, I missed that. You've taken us out of ourselves. Yes. No, I've lost Ian. I can't, I didn't quite catch what you said, Ian. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you, but I couldn't quite catch what you said. Uh, uh, I was saying you've taken us out of ourselves. We've been locked, locked away and you've, you've taken us to Isla. Wonderful. Yes, and I think that's fine. I'm, I'm happy to sort of uh, take you to, to go to Ben and Bowie. And if you guys are there, if Tony's there, you there, Alistair's there, we can, we can talk to the cows come home and we can easily fill an hour. <laughs> I think we can spend an hour at Ben and Bowie without any problem whatsoever. We have to avoid getting shot, though. Yeah. Well, uh, it's we, not the season yet, is it? It's not, they're not hunting yet. No, no, they hunt geologists all year round. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We have, we do have some access issues with Dunloss, and we have to ask uh -huh. their permission very carefully to take groups there. It's, uh, it's not. So, the how are you going to get there next next week then? Because there's the forest that they've just planted. So, what route are you planning? Um, I, I'm going to show you that. We, I've, 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 I've sussed it all out. I mean, I've, we, we, we do, we do have a route through the new deer fencing uh, at Ben and Bowie, right. and there Good. are there are strategic gates that we can use. It just makes it a little bit longer in. But the, you can go through the new deer gates, and uh, and I'm and I'm writing it all up um, with the new access around the southern end of the lock. You have to go around the western end of, and the southern end of, of Loch Lossett, and then through through two new deer gates to get onto the, into the exposures. But you, it is accessible. Um, but they've created a sort of a large enclosed area, which they talk about it all being lovely sustainable woodland, but it's mainly for woodcock shooting. Yes. Which are smaller than geologists, so that they should be able to tell the difference. <laughs> yeah, well, I tend to want, when I do ask for access to Ben and Bowie from Dunlosset Estate, we just go for Sundays these days because they don't shoot on a Sunday. So Sunday's much, much easier in terms of a request, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm going to call it a day because I'm going to go out and clap for the carers. Um, Very good. Okay, so uh, thanks everybody for listening in and maybe see you all next week. Yeah? Yeah, yes. thank you. Thank okay. you. All the best. Bye. Bye now. Hi, Mirren. <laughs> See you there. Hi. Uh, thanks. <laughs> okay. Bye.